I think it was my favorite album since very young age. And one of the reasons, beyond the beautiful musical layers and the amount of details that are there in the arrangement process and in the sound process, I think it's the emotional arc. The emotional range of this album is quite astounding. And you can hear so many things from beginning to end. You can feel sadness, depression, anger, relief, um, meditation. There are so many different things that one feels when they listen to this uh, album. If we go over the songs there, as mentioned earlier, we start with Shining Crazy Diamond parts one through five, and we end with Shine On parts six to nine. The original plan was to actually have it in a single piece that uh, its length is something like 24 minutes, but then there was a decision to slice it to two different pieces and enter three new songs in the middle. I'm going to concentrate today in Shining the Crazy Diamond, both halves, but the other three pieces obviously resonate for everything we're going to talk about today. So it all starts with Sid Barrett, as I mentioned, who was the founder of the band, the original guitarist, songwriter, and singer, leader of the band for the first year, years, album and a half, until he lost his hold on reality due to drug use and mental problems, apparently a lot of stress from the industry, from his band members maybe, fellow members. And this trauma remained for many years an issue for everyone involved. And it also resonated with guilt because there's the famous story that the Floyd members someday just decided let's not pick up Sid for the following gig because he's only causing trouble. It's not fun anymore, he's not contributing anything to the music, he's in his own world. And for years, uh, there are interviews about that, you know, they've been carrying these hard feelings of sadness and longing to their friend and their someone who was very part of their identity, but also, also guilt. Roger Waters said, when he came to write Shining Crazy Diamond, I wanted to get as close as possible to what I felt. That sort of indefinable, inevitable melancholy about the disappearance of Sid. Because he has left, withdrawn so far away that, as far as we were concerned, he's no longer there. This sounds like he's talking about someone who passed away, and that's the way they felt about it, and the entire world felt about it for many years because Barrett never came back to himself. He released a few solo albums with a lot of help from his friends that were very problematic by themselves. But from the band's point of view, Barrett was no longer there. Stage theories of grief became pretty common both in the clinical world and in the public. The notion that there is a psychological response to loss involves an orderly progression through distinct stages of bereavement. The classic way to look at it, that the first stage is numbness, also denial, so we're still not aware of the trauma, what exactly happened. Going to yearning, to craving, longing, missing. Every stage theory has its own names, but I chose the words that fit best to my, what I want to introduce to you today. Followed by anger, mourning, and acceptance. It doesn't have to be in this order, and many different research show that the idea is that each one of these emotions usually occur when one recovers from loss of someone. As I mentioned before, this loss is often referred to as death, but death is not the only uh, major event in life that uh, have these stages of grief about. It can be a loss of any, any type of loss. So it's definitely Sid Barrett's loss in the eyes of the band is something that intrigued this kind of emotions. And I was curious to see that when I think about the emotional arc of the album we should be here, and specifically Shining Crazy Diamond, I can hear these emotions. I think, if you think of it, there's a lot of anger there. Heavy cigars and very angry peace, welcoming the machine even more. But what about we should be here? What about the last chords of the album? What about the beginning? There are many different things there. And I think that's one of the reasons this album, this track, Shining Your Crazy Diamond, is so successful, because it talks to us on so many levels and shows such a wide range of different emotions. So let's start from the beginning. Let's listen how the album begins.
We have a single harmony, G minor chord, static, with shimmering keyboard layers. With this lofty horn sound, keyboard. Just hold the tonic, just the G minor key over these static keyboard layers. And again, it's an invitation to meditate, numbness feeling. Obviously, looking back, there's something here that invites you to look back into the past. Then there's a guitar solo that follows, but in a very, a very Pink Floydian fashion. It goes very slowly. We start a harmonic progression, which means the chords start moving, but they're so slow. If you compare it to song of any other band where the chords usually change every three seconds, seven seconds, ten seconds, here we have these harmonic progressions where each chord can last as many as 40, 50 seconds. It takes a lot of time. Let's listen to that. We have this very nice slow build-up with a lot of space to think and to, to remember. Until we have this last cadence. Da -da -dai, da -da 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 -dai. Everything fades out. And probably one of the most recognizable hooks in the history of rock music is coming. such a long, it was 3 minutes and 40 seconds until this motif appeared, which is enough for like a Beatles and a half song, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
And something is different here. Once you hear these notes, you know something is about to come, right? I think that the emotion here has switched to something a bit different, and I think of it as yearning. Specifically, I call these notes the yearning motif. Let's see for a second what Waters wrote about, said about these notes. To Waters, these notes resonated with a profound melancholy that brought the specter of Sid Barrett inescapably to mind. The idea of this entire song, the seed that began the writing of the song, were these four notes. So let's talk for a second about what is so special about these four notes. You know, when I was introduced to Pink Floyd in my teens, I probably played these notes like that. Same thing, but how much it's not the same thing. Listen to that again. Here. First of all, I'm using the guitar technique, I'm using open strings, which is something you see a lot in music, of, in rock music. It comes from the guitar, it was born on the guitar, and you can see that the Gilmore came out, came out in this way. And the open strings allow you to have all four notes resonate simultaneously. So it's both a melody and a chord at the same time. Second, it allows you to have different timbre. This sounds completely different. If I do... I'm losing it. So you have... And this together, that's for me this bittersweet sadness for union. Why is that so? The entire song began with the G minor chord. Pink Floyd always has seven on their, on their minor chord, so G minor seven, these two notes are part of this chord, but this one is not. Okay, so you have these four notes, what is this note doing there? Now it's more than that, this note did not appear before that, you had three minutes and forty seconds of much simpler melody that did not include this note. You have these notes uh, as part of the guitar solo and the keyboard solo. You can play a lot of nice bluesy notes on that. But they never touch this degree. So here's how foreign it sounds. That's a sixth degree of the minor scale. This note does not appear. Nor this note appears. This is the two versions of the sixth degree. That's if you're in a minor mode, this one is Dorian mode. But both Richard Wright and David Gilmour avoid them completely. They play three minutes and 40 seconds. changes, both in the arrangement and in the composition, start derived from this motif. The first one arrives right away. So we're in G minor, still holding into the keyboards. And this note, a bit foreign, but still sounds good.
time. <laughs> Everything is built around the relationship of these two chords. So they knew this chord already. But I think the idea came from here. Let's hear it in the original version. that contemporary Greek theories take this union and say it's actually much more significant than another state. So they actually try to do in, uh, empirical examination of stage theory, try to actually do a survey of people uh, who are believing and trying to see how they actually felt about the stages. And people say that union was significantly more common than depressing, despite the closer focus in previous research. Union is the main emotion reaction to loss. And I think that union here, as I said, is the catalysis for the entire song, actually, and occupies most of the song. Um, so first, it initiates, as we saw, da -da -da -da, this melodic progression. But let's see what happens after that. This motif that was in the front line goes to the back. Think about this motif as being in front of you, and now going to the background. Something else is about to happen. 
The meter of the section is 664. And that's the complement. But then there's a beautiful moment that happens. We have a switch of the meter from 64 to 128. It sounds like that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm playing the same thing. It's kind of the guitar, this motif catalyzes the entire band to change with it. And the, or the extraordinary thing that happens in the melody, or what happens in the saxophone solo at this point, it switches from ten to battery to tenor. Thank you. Where the baritone saxophone solo is switched to tenor solo, it's an extraordinary moment. Let's listen to that. both of them well. I don't know, but it all together works very well as part of the same arrangement process. I think it starts with the guitar, at least that's the way it's, it, I hear it. We have this guitar motif changing, helping to change the meter. We're going to do a skip now to the second half of Shining the Crazy Diamond, toward the end of the album. <laughs> same tonal center, but the rhythm and the arrangement changes are what make it interesting, and they all start from this motif. Um, let's skip to the guitar solo, the slide guitar solo that Dave Malt mentioned earlier. I think now we're switching actually to a different emotion. I think starting with Heavy Cigar, Welcome to the Machine, we're going to the anger zone, and I think the peak of the level, emotional level of this entire album is actually instrumental. In general, in for music, I think the emotional peaks are instrumental and not vocal. So this guitar solo, I think, is the climax of this album.
with this fast beat and the slide guitar. Where can you go when you play such solo? Do you want to make it more and more exciting? How do you build the architecture of this solo to enhance this emotion? Keep in mind the last line. Da, 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 da. We have this descending line. Let's see, let's see where David Gilmore takes it. Now remember the descending line I just pointed out. Let's see what happens now when we arrive to the descending line. excitements, we build it up, and then it all just fell. And I think this solo just reflects that. We have these levels, more and more levels of intensity and of emotion and of anger <coughs> until it all collapses. And it collapses with two guitars playing simultaneously in thirds, and there's a beautiful effect here. Uh, you can see in the notation if you read music, we start with a third of the two guitars descending, and then they switch, and they do like that, and then they switch, and they do like that. So it even emphasized the idea of this fall by two guitars changing between them. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump to the end where I think we can see a bit of mourning and then followed by acceptance, which is the closure of the album. <laughs> This is Richard Wright's main contribution to the, this song, to this piece. He wrote it solo, he gets the solo credit of this section. And there's a very sad, funeral-like harmonic progression. that did it like Bach and all these guys. And this moment for me, that's the moment that we go really to the last stage of grief, the acceptance. Let's hear the original.
find this emotional arc incredible. We started with this mysterious atmosphere of the numbness, we went through yearning, we went through a lot of anger, we had a bit of mourning, and then definitely we have this peaceful place where we're in peace with ourselves. And I think Pink Floyd, maybe Roger Waters, who wrote the lyrics for this song, needed this piece in order to move on and recover. And there's an interesting detail that new research about grief say that in the past we have the goal of the grief was to need to heal, to have pathological heal. It's if we had a problem and now we need to recover, and the recovery was often associated with trying to detach ourselves from this person. New literature, though, say that actually adapting to the loss and adapting elements from the person we lost is actually very valuable. And I think it's interesting that at the end of Shining the Crazy Diamonds, Richard Wright quotes C. Emily Play. Emily Play, this very notes, if you hear, let's hear that. So I think he adapts Sid Barrett rather than forgetting about him. <laughs> Thank you very much.